Welcome everyone to probabilistic reasoning and machine learning. Today we continue with PCA. Um, we added a new topic, support vector machines, the last three times, and we talked about it in great detail. So it is much greater detail than just being able to apply support vector machines, right? For that, you just need to say import sklearn, and then you have your support vector machine and you can run it. And you have some parameters, some hyperparameters, C, and you can run cross-validation and you can fit data. But that's not the point of this lecture. So the point of this lecture is that you understand the method so that you will be able to invent such methods yourself, okay? And also that you are able to read research papers that explain how this method works or how new method works that, you, that we don't know, that I don't know, okay? Maybe that come out in Europe next week. So that's the point of going through all the pain. And I promise you, people who are like leaders in the field, they know how to derive the support vector machines. So you, sh you better should, should do this as well and learn it. And um, again, use the resources, use the chat, use the TA, ask us if you get stuck and start early. And then you can ask us anything yeah? and we will help you, right? We don't leave you, like, if you say, no, I'm stuck, I don't know what to do with this question, we will tell you. Okay, let's continue today with um, support, uh, oh, with PCA, principal component analysis. And I made an, a little overview what we are going through. So those are the steps. Sometimes when you go through the slides, maybe it's clear to me what it is, what I want to show you, but sometimes maybe for you it's not so clear. So if you get lost, try to find the topic here. So first I will explain in general what is dimensionality reduction, yeah, how I view it. Then I show you a variant of PCA where we minimize the mean squared error. So that's one way to think about PCA. However, there's another one. We could also maximize the variance. That's another option. And curiously, they are equivalent. So we will prove that yeah, with our typical hand-wavy computer scientist style of proving things, right? Lots of linear algebra, some transformations, and then everything is easy. In between, we have a code demo, and we also derive why are the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix the solution to PCA. That's also quite interesting. Yeah? And look at other resources. If you find um, better explanations, please tell me. I will put them into next year's lecture. Yeah? So it's always good to improve things. So if you find certain derivations complicated or unclear, and you find a better one elsewhere on Stack Overflow or whatever, tell me. I will put it in. And finally, of course, I will also tell you the algorithm, PCA step by step, because the canonical exercise is to implement PCA after this lecture. Okay, so that will be your task. Um, okay, so far so good. So here comes dimensionality reduction. So the high level idea is that we have very high dimensional data and we want to project it into a low dimensional space. So we want to kind of make it more easy to handle, but we want to do it in such a way that we don't lose so much information, yeah? Um, possibly this could make a classification problem easier, right? So there might be methods which are super expensive in high dimensions, but they are cheaper in lower dimensions. For example, linear regression. Maybe you like linear regression very much and you really believe in it, but your data is like a million dimensional space. Then linear regression might not be a clever idea, in particular not if you want to apply basis functions. But first reduce it with PCA and then run linear regression. Then it might be an option, okay? So some simple approaches, you just throw away some of the dimensions. And it sounds like a super stupid idea, but it's called random projection in a way. So it's a random projection. And curiously, if your data is like in a general position, whatever that means in space, then just getting rid of dimensions is not a bad idea. So often there are redundancies in these dimensions and not everything is necessary. Example, so where's my manifold here? So let's take that one. So this is my 2D space, okay? It has two coordinate axes, but I map it into 3D and now it's in 3D, okay? So this is a point cloud. All the points on the sheet of paper are um, now in 3D. Now when I look from this side, I see a sheet of paper. When I look from that side, I see a sheet of paper. And when you look from the top, you see something like this. So from all directions, it looks like there's some data. However, if I turn around like this, and suddenly you see that it's very flat. So the true dimension of this thing here is two, and it's not three. Even though when you look from all pairs of coordinate axes, you see something which is like filling up the space. And now imagine something in 
uh, what is it? Uh, let's say the MNIST digits. I think 18 by 18 pixel or something, or 27 by 27. I forgot what the square of 27 is. But, so then you have that many dimensions, and the question is maybe the data is also on some lower dimensional manifold. And so it might be interesting to reduce the data. Okay, so that is dimensionality reduction. Now, let's again take this example and let's randomly ignore some of the axes. Let's ignore um, this axis. Then it just looks like that, and that's fine, right? So the data is intrinsically low dimensional. It is in some random position. Just ignoring some of the axes is totally fine. You get all information that there is, okay? There's no added information in the third dimension. Um, however, it gets, of course, uh, more difficult, let's say, if you have a curve manifold, your data could look like this, right? Why not? I mean, nature kind of generated somehow your data, and it could be on a curve manifold because there are some laws of physics behind, right? In physics, some laws are nonlinear, so maybe you get something nonlinear here. Or it could be like really like on a Swiss roll type of thing. That's a famous data set that is typically used as a benchmark for checking nonlinear dimensionality reduction methods. And also in that case, you say, yeah, but if I look locally, if I take here a local region, yeah, then I see that intrinsically it's two-dimensional. So in every local region, it looks like a piece of paper. Yeah, but then overall, it looks like something more complicated. But in principle, I can unfold it maybe. Okay? By the way, this talking about a local region, it's like the definition for manifolds in mathematics. That's basically how it's defined. Locally, something is the R to the 2, for example. Then if that's the case, then the whole thing is a manifold. Okay? Again, this is my hand wavy half knowledge of mathematics. But approximately, it's, this is very related. On the other hand, ideas from mathematics, of course, might lead to new approaches in this field as well, right? They often did. Okay, another one is ignore the dimensions with low variance. Okay, suppose now these are your three axes. By the way, is this on the video? No, it's not. So I should stand here or I should switch on. Okay, so you miss, so on the video, you miss everything. I think. So there's some advantage getting to the lecture. So uh, let's say um, by chance this two-dimensional manifold is oriented with the axis. Okay? And in that case, uh, you could ask, okay, on this axis I have a certain variance, on this axis I have a certain variance, and on that axis the variance is zero. So how about removing the axis with variance zero, right? So that might be a good choice. But as I said, if it's like in a general position, then all the axes have some relevant variance, and you can't do this, OK? OK, how about we have our general position, and now we first orient our data set in such a way that like the axes with lots of variance, they are oriented with my coordinate axis, and then there are some axes which are very, have very s small variance. If you do this, this is PCA, OK? So this is principal component analysis where this is the first principal component because it has the largest variance, this is the second principal component, and now this is the third principal component with the smallest variance, okay? Also note, in PCA, um, your new coordinate system, the, the axes will be all on a right angle on each other, so basically you're really rotating the space into a new system, so you are not allowed to do a distortion like that, okay? So this is PCA in a nutshell. You have some high-dimensional cloud of points, and you try to rotate the space in such a way that the direction of largest variance is oriented with one of the coordinate axes, and the direction of second largest variance is oriented with another coordinate axis, and so on. OK, that's it. And the short answer how to do is you calculate the covariance matrix, calculate the eigenvectors, and that's it. OK, so this is PCA. So let's see why that's the case, and let's write it all nicely down and do some calculations, OK? So did I say everything that's written down here? Um, yes, I think that's that what I say, we, what I said. So you rotate the space um, before ignoring some dimensions of low variance. That's the, exactly how you do it. And it's based on linear algebra, of course, um, in particular on eigenvalue decomposition. Maybe I should get rid of the SVD here, so I think Ah, no, you can put it in. You can also use SVD for, for PCA. That's also possible, OK? Maybe I should include that into the lecture. I only use eigenvalues for now. 
Um, in general, um, so that was a preview on PCA. In general, the problem of dimensionality reduction could be defined like that. So now let's have some notation. We have a data matrix X, yeah, where now the data vectors are column vectors, okay, and we have n of them. And we say, since it's high dimensional, we take a capital D for the large dimensionality. So it's a D by n matrix. And the goal is to find a low dimensional representation of this data set, so some other column vectors, yeah, so again, n column vectors, but that are only d dimensional, so they should be have a lower dimension, yeah, so d is much smaller typically than capital D, okay? And now this doesn't have to be linear in this case, so it could be also some nonlinear dimensionality reduction. The only thing that I want is it should keep the properties of my high dimensional data. Well, this is really left unclear what I exactly mean by properties. Different properties will lead to different methods, okay? So, first option, if I want to keep the variance, then I will have PCA, for example, okay? Um, if I want to keep neighborhood relationships, then I have some other fancy methods that we will look at after PCA, okay? So, and neighborhood relationships, what does it mean? So you have your cloud of points, and there's a digit two up here, and then there are some neighboring digits too, so you want to have in the low dimensional embedding, those neighbors should be your neighbors too, okay? So if you are close by at certain points in the lower dimensional embedding, these points should be also close by. Why is that useful? Because if you want to do classification, of course, you might compare yourself with your neighbors, and it's all about proximity, okay? Okay, so far so good. Now I said, find a low dimensional representation, and I wrote it as yet another data set, basically, right? Um, sometimes we can also model our representation as a map, yeah? So the map going from the high dimensions into the low dimensions. In particular, as this, if this map is a linear mapping, we can represent it by some matrix W. And then we could write the Z is W transpose times X. So what is W transpose times X? Again, since I'm, I'm a big fan of linear algebra, let me spell it out for you. When I find my chalk, so where's my chalk? My chalk is gone. That is very bad. But I have some secret sock, chalk. So, what I wanted to show you was, so why does this make sense to write it, to write, like, given a data set here, given a data set over there, why is that like a linear mapping here? Why, why does it make sense? So let's write it out. So this is set one and so on, Zn. So this is the data set over here. And then I have my W transpose and then I have my X1. Now what's happening is this is a matrix, matrix multiplication. And I'm taking the first row of this one and multiply it with the first column, right? where the first row now is also something interesting. So the W, let's write it as W1 to W, and now we need to do a little bit of thinking. So what number should I have down there? So the X is D by N, and the Z is, oh, that is the capital D, and this is a small d. So what shape does the W have? Any ideas? So the thing, I also didn't think about it, right? I just came up now with the question, and I think those are the questions that you have to ask yourself when you see an equation like that. Yeah, do I know what the dimensions are? And think about it. And do it always. Then you get, get fast at it. Ah, okay, we don't know it. You don't know it. So let's write it out and let's see how it goes. So the W transpose basically now is, so here's my question mark. So um, the W transpose is the W1 transpose and so on until the W, we still don't know it. Question mark, so it will be row times column. So what is the number of rows in W? Any guess? I tell you, it's either N or capital D or little d, right? 
I mean, you knew that possibly already. Okay. Um, okay, let's go on. So this is d by n. So we can write it nicely next to it. Okay. We can also write it nicely next to this expression, right? And we see, okay, x must have as many. Oh, yeah, that's, that's fitting. That's nice. However, the d inside here, that is the dimensionality of the x. And so now I know w transpose is little d times capital D, okay? In particular, that means that the w is it the other way around. So that will be a capital D times little d. And then we know what this question mark here is. Okay, interesting. So it looks like the w kind of is a new coordinate system, kind of, right? So the first vector here, yeah, we take the, the inner product of this vector with each of those to generate the first coordinate in z. And then to get the second coordinate for all these z's, I take the second w yeah, and calculate all the inner products. So it would be very reasonable to say that the wij, if I multiply two of each other, yeah, they should be orthogonal and have length one. So they are exactly equal to my Iverson brackets, i equals zero. Okay? Or if you like, you can also use the Dirac delta. But yeah, I think the Iverson brackets are nicer. So this is um, something very reasonable to do because then kind of the projections are really measured in centimeters or something. They are kind of good. This could be also written as W transpose W being equal to the identity matrix. Okay, that's the same statement. Now, if we have that one, we could also ask, so what about W times W transpose? Is it also the identity matrix? Any ideas? So people are doing this, I take this as an answer. No, it's not. Right, you're right. So this doesn't have to be the identity matrix. That's only the case if the W is a square matrix. Okay? Then you can turn it around, but not for a rectangular matrix. So let's draw the pictures here. So this one is the W is large, the D is small, and then we transpose it. So this product, W transpose times W, it's this picture. Okay? So you have a couple of vectors, and you compare them with a couple of other vectors. However, the other picture here will be that one, OK? And that has some interesting property. So the inner dimension is much smaller than the other one. So this thing will have a low rank, OK? Do you know the rank of a matrix, by the way? Remember? Kind of. OK, I tell you, so the rank of W is at most the little d, right? It cannot be the capital D, because it's a number of, um, what are they called, independent? No, not independent. So this is not really linear algebra that I didn't prepare. What are they called if they are? Um, yeah, linear one, yeah, what is it in English? OK, then it is independent, OK. So it's a number of linearly independent columns that we have, and we have D. And even though we have capital D many entries here, so we could have capital D many vectors, but if they only have dimensionality little d, yeah, there's no chance that we can fit, let's say, five uh, very, uh, no, 10 very low dimensional vectors yeah, in a five dimensional space, they cannot be linearly independent. Okay? So the rank of this one is mostly the small d. Okay, and you can see it from this product thingy here. So, okay. okay, so far so good. A matrix where we have W transpose times W and the other way around as well. A squared matrix is also called orthonormal or unitary. Okay? And with other words, such a W has um, three vectors, for example, in 3D in there, and any of these are uni is a unitary matrix, no matter how rotated. Important is that I keep the right angles. So any rotation is a unitary matrix. We have a combination now of a unitary matrix and this 
projection onto some smaller space. Okay, so we have some orthonormal system of vectors here, yeah, which are in a right angle to each other and have length one that's not only orthogonal but also orthonormal. So the orthogonal are the ones that give you a zero here, and the orthonormality gives you a one as well for the one with itself. And um, so basically, those is the rotation of the space and taking a subspace. So far, so good. Where did I want to go? Oh, yeah, understanding this. So now we see, basically, let's just focus on x1. So it's the first column over here, and it will generate the first column over there. So how is it calculated? By projecting the xi onto the w1, onto the w2, onto the w3, and so forth. And the projections on it, or projections, the inner products with it, they are the coordinates of my z1. And then for all the other matrices. Okay, so far so good. So we see that I could write the linear mapping like this, just as w transpose times x. Like that's a reasonable way to do it. Why do I like it? Because then the columns of the w, they are like the basis vectors, and I can read them off as column vectors. Okay? So, in principle, W is an arbitrary rectangular matrix. Yeah? It doesn't have to be like with right angles. In principle, I could have anything here, but in PCA, we will have right angles. Okay? I could also have a nonlinear mapping yeah, to represent going from a high dimensional space to a low dimensional space. And um, the nonlinear mapping is characterized by some function f. This function f could be a neural network parameterized with some gigantic parameter vector, okay? Or any other nonlinear function, yeah? Could be anything. Uh, there's another way. So this is, those are parametric representations, where parametric means there is some parameter. So here's my parameter w. Here are the parameters of the neural network. And the number of parameters is independent of the number of data points. If I do it non-parametrically, then suddenly I don't have the parameters as I know them, but my parameters are basically the embedding itself. So I have a set of points, 100 points in the high dimensions, and I have 100 points in the lower dimensions, and this table of map, uh, gives me basically the mapping and describes it. Okay, So that's another way to represent the mapping. However, if I, need, if I get more points, I also need more parameters in a way. That's why it's called non-parametric. Okay? And that's the basis, basic idea for isomap and LLE, as we will see. Of course, here the natural question is now, this mapping is nicer, right? The neural network, I can just feed in any data, and it will project it nicely, or my W does it also. So how can I map here other points if I just have this table of input-output examples? I can use, for example, nearest neighbors or something. Yeah? If I have a new point, I look for the nearest neighbor among the x, and then I take the linear combination of the, of the mapped points, basically. Okay, So that's a way to do that. And that's the way to do it, for example, for isomap. So far, so good. So those are representations for these dimensionality reduction mappings. So far, so good. OK. Now we will only use the one on top here with the W, and we only consider a W which is unitary, or at least it will have this property, that one. And I will call such a matrix unitary as well, okay, or orthonormal, because the column vectors are orthonormal to each other. Okay, so let's start with principal component. I showed it already with some dance here, what principal component is, right, um, in words. Find a new coordinate system that fits well to the data. Uh, that's another description of PCA. It is very old, so I think I got this information from Wikipedia. Yeah, so there's an old paper from 1901 from Carl Pearson, a great statistician, and it's called On Lines and Planes of Closest Fit to Systems of Points in Space. Wow, what a description. That is exactly PCA, right? You have points in space, some point cloud, and you are looking for some line or through some plane that has the closest fit to the system. So the closest fit is the mean squared error. Okay? And it was published in Philosophical Magazine. Okay, I don't know what the other articles are. Um, later, th this method was reinvented over and over and over again. Yeah? Because it's a useful thing everywhere where you have data, people can come up with that one. Yeah? So there are many names for this one. This is a list of names for the same thing. 
I think we call it Hauptachsen transformation in linear algebra, right? In signal processing, people call it Kahun Löwe transform, yeah? And so there are many other things. So, Hoteling transform because of the, this, this author here. And where did he publish? He published in Educational Psychology. So, he's probably an applied person who got some interesting data set and he invented maybe something to reduce the dimensionality of his data. Okay? Now, in the time of the internet and having all papers available, do look at Carl Pearson's paper, right? Just download it and look at it. It's so easy. In older times, you had to go to the library and, ah, this is too much work, right? We don't walk to the library and take and go there. And, and then the, it's not there and it was all a waste of time. And so we don't do it. Today, we just click a little bit around and then we have it. So here you have it. So this is the paper, okay? Um, and Okay, not so fancy. The, the title is not typeset so effectively here, but this is the title here. And um, it just starts, okay, in many physical, statistical, biological investigations, somehow it's desirable to represent a system of points in the plane. Yeah, so we want to fit a straight line or something through it, okay? And then the paper goes on and on and on. And there's also a nice picture, yeah? So this is a nice picture. Here we have two-dimensional data, and you're trying to fit a nice line through this. Now, when I saw this, pi this picture, it reminded me very much of our linear regression picture that I always draw, right? So let's compare them, because it tells us something about linear regression, yeah? So let's have a look at that one. <coughs> so let me um, copy this picture from um, Carl Pearson. So he has some two-dimensional data set, x1, x2. And then he fits a straight line through it. And he did it in such a way by minimizing these distances here of the data points. And that is exactly PCA, okay? Minimizing the square distances to some straight line. By the way, if you are bored, you can also build your analog computer with this one, right? If you have a data set of two dimensions, you take a big wooden brett, wooden board, wooden board properly, and you put nails in it, yeah, for your data points. So the data points are nails in your wooden board, and then you take like some, some long stick and you put some gummy bender, some gummies, I don't know what is in English. What is it? rubber bands to it, okay? And then the stick will stabilize right at the solution. Of course, now comes the physicist and she says, ah, this is not a squared thing here. This is not a squared error if you take rubber bands. So it might be different, okay? But intuitively, it's, it's a nice thing. Okay, let's look at linear regression. So this is PCA yeah, from Carl Pearson, Pearson, a figure. Let's look at the linear regression picture. And let's take exactly the same data set, okay? So here's exactly the same data set. And let's fit a line through it. And now, how are we doing it now? So typically, one of the coordinates is called x and the other one is called y, okay? So there's like an asymmetry. Here, there's, they are symmetric, kind of. So none of them has like a more important meaning. Here, they kind of have something different. And then we are minimizing the mean squared error only along the y-axis. So in this case, we are minimizing this error here. OK? And this is, of course, much harder to build with rubber bands. But so this is basically like the yeah, the relation between linear regression and PCA. So they are somehow closely related. However, here you're only measuring the error along, the, along one of the axes. And in PCA, you are measuring the error like along both axes, okay? But apart from that, they are very similar, okay? Okay, let's go back to the, let's close this one. Let's get back to that one. And um, so let's, 
we have to get to the mass at some point, right? It's so much fun to draw pictures, but we have to go through the mass too, be because we want to understand why are the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix the answer, okay? So that's what we are going to learn today, ideally. So as I said, the short version is find a new coordinate system that fits the data well. Now, what is the new coordinate system? So it's defined by some rotation of the data, and I told you already, it can be done, for example, by a unitary matrix. That one is rotating the data, but it's rotating all axes, yeah? So it is the square matrix. If it's a square matrix, then typically, oh, I need to practice this marking again. So then typically we have said both W, W transpose, and W transpose W, both are the identity matrix. However, in PCA we are typically interested in f having fewer columns than rows in the W, so we want to reduce the dimensionality. And then we have a rectangular matrix, and we only are left with one of the properties, okay? However, the intuition that it's kind of a rotation of the space makes totally sense. However, then some of the axes are ignored, okay? So far, so good. So here comes the first version. So this is a lot of text. It's a horrible slide, I know. So let's go through it step by step. Maybe I should, should improve it. So this is PCA version one, okay? Version one tries to minimize the mean squared error just as I did on the board with the rubber bands. That is minimizing the mean squared error. So I'm starting with my data matrix, yeah? And I assume for simplicity that the mean is zero. Putting the mean in here into all this equation, it's trivial but messy, yeah? And it's kind of not so clear as without the mean. So let's assume the mean is already removed. What does it mean to remove the mean? It means, let's say you have a big cloud of twos up there, and then you move them to the origin, so that the mean of the twos is now in the origin. Do they still look like twos? Kind of, right? When they are up here, only the, where my, my pen was, I have some black ink and the rest is white. And when I move the whole thing to the origin, then suddenly there are more ink pixels suddenly. So it kind of looks like reverse. You can give it a try. Move the MNIST digits to the origin and look at them. How do they look? They still look a little bit like twos, but there are now more ink pixels in there, okay? However, in general, the shape of the data didn't change. I'm just shifting it. I'm not distorting it. So if it was looking like this, I'm shifting it and it's still looking the same. Okay, now, minimizing the mean squared error. By that I mean find a lower dimensional embedding. So that means find a lower dimensional data matrix that approximates x, yeah? And a linear mapping w such that the following mean squared error is minimized. And the first difficult step in today's lecture is to understand why the summation along the data point is the same as the Frobenius norm of this expression. Once you accept it that this is the same, we can go on with the Frobenius norm and we don't have to write so many indices. So let's, look at, let's first look at this one. So this says, so the square distance between the true high dimensional point yeah, and my coordinate z that are back projected into the high dimensional space, yeah, this distance should be small. So let's first try to understand this expression here. What are we calculating here? Again on the board, so um, before we had z being equal to w transpose times x, right? So. Um, now we're doing something else. We are saying w times some zi, okay? And now how does this work? This is like saying um, I'm having w1 times the first coordinate of z1, so zi, so let's say this is the first coordinate of zi, okay, times w1, plus the second coordinate of Z, zi, okay, times w2, plus and so on times the little d's coordinate times wd. Okay, so that is just written out this, uh, the matrix vector multiplication. A way to think about it is also, um, yeah, like a row times vector multiplication, you could also think of moving the vector like on top of the matrix 
in writing it out, right? So you have your W. And then you have your, your ZI and you move it up here. So you have a ZI1 and so on and the ZI D. And that's what's happening in the row times column, right? So the first row times column, the second row times column, so I can put them up here. Those are scalars times vector and I'm summing everything up. That's why that is equal to that one. And now I'm, I'm comparing this with the original vector xi, right? So there's always, I have to ensure that this is not a mismatch in the sizes, right? So let's think about it. The w was compatible with the x, so the number of uh, rows in w was matching the number of rows in the x, okay? So a linear combination of w's is really in the same space as my x's. Actually, those w's, they really live in the high dimensional space, and they are the new coordinate axis, for example, like this. And then you can project down on them, and you will have your z's that live then in the two-dimensional space, for example. OK, so it kind of makes sense to compare these, right? So, and ideally, the zi contains enough information to have a good reconstruction of the xi. Now, looking back at um, our picture from Pearson, now, where is this stuff now here going on? So this is kind of our vector w, this long thing here. Yeah? And the origin is actually must be somewhere on the line, of course. But um, now by projecting, so this projection up here yeah, was calculating, basically, if this is the 0, it was calculating whatever, 1, and then you have 2, and maybe here there's a 2.5, and so on. And to that direction, I have some other numbers. So really numbers along this axis. And then I can take this one w vector that I have and multiply it with these numbers here. And I will get exactly this point or that point, and I compare it with the true one. So that might be xi, and then this is um, the zi. OK? Makes sense? Good. Some people are nodding. Some people are doing nothing. OK, question. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, and of course, the picture is nice. It kind of makes more sense. Because otherwise, I always would have some offset here and blah, blah, blah. But it is because I said at the beginning, I removed the mean. And that's why it's right in the center here. And then all the equations get much easier. OK, so you can really visualize this calculation here. So it kind of makes sense to say, OK, uh, I want to have the squared norm of that, oh, that's now not, so let's write it like this maybe. So that is something reasonable to minimize. OK, let's take such a vector. Let's say I have a vector v, and I'm taking the squared norm. Then that is just v transpose v. It's just the inner product with itself. So with other words, uh, this can be also written xi times, no, that is not a w, w zi transpose, and then again xi minus w zi. OK, so far so good. OK, so now, um, where are my slides? Here we are. My slides are gone. Did I close them? Where's the preview program? OK, here's something going wrong. Ah, here we go. Is my computer too slow for this setup here? That's weird. Um, OK, now I hope I convince you that minimizing the mean squared error is this expression here, right? So summing over all data points. Now the next step is, why is that the same as the next expression, right? So for that one, um, let me tell you again what was the Frobenius norm. OK, Frobenius norm is, in my opinion, like the natural generalization of the normal squared norm or the inner product norm for matrices. Yeah, so for scalars, the norm is just, the squared norm is just value, the value squared, and it tells us something how far away we are from the origin. And then for a vector, it also tells us something about how far away we are from the origin, and we just take the inner product with itself. And then for matrices, um, it would be also nice to sum up all entries squared. Yeah, and I think I showed you already 
that the trace of A transpose A is doing exactly that. Yeah, it's doing exactly the right thing. So A transpose A, it is calculating many things. So there are also some AIJ going on to some AKL, yeah, some weird terms that I actually don't want to have. But then if I take the trace of the result, I'm only left with the one that I wanted. Okay? Try it in a Jupyter notebook that this is indeed the case. Okay? So from now on for the Frobenius norm, we can just write trace of A transpose A. There is another norm, another matrix norm, which is typically written with a sub 2. Yeah? I don't know whether it's the L2 norm for matrices. I forgot. And that's typically defined to be the largest eigenvalue of the matrix A transpose A. And that is not the Frobenius norm. Why? Because let's say you have some matrix and you form the matrix A transpose A. Then the A transpose A is somehow describing some ellipsoid. And the largest eigenvalue is the longest radius of this ellipsoid. And so now you can imagine there are other dimensions that can vary arbitrarily, but the largest eigenvalue stays the largest eigenvalue, so the norm stays constant. Okay, so this is only looking at one of the directions, at the main direction of the matrix, but not at all simultaneously. So this looks to me much more natural. Yeah? So far, so good. So let's look at this Frobenius norm here. So it's the ent so every entry of this difference yeah, gets squared and everything gets summed up. So let's look at that one. So here we are also um, squaring every entry. In each of the sum end, we are having a single vector x, x1 and another vector z1. And so this is the um, inner product norm of this vector. So we are squaring every entry and summing everything up. However, we have an outer sum, summing basically over all data points. So this summation is really taking all the entries of this matrix, squaring them, and summing everything up. OK, is that fine? Approximately. So um, I, I, I show you something on the board. So this is not, not working anymore. So what's going on here? So why, where's my cursor? OK, so here I'm back to the board. Um, so it looks like you like to see these calculations. <coughs> and it's good that you ask, because I'm expecting from you that you are able to do it in your homeworks. <laughs> anyway, so I said there's a trace. Let's take a look at this case. OK, that's already interesting to see. So first of all, let's write out the multiplication here. So we will get some matrix. Yeah, and let me write it. I don't know. I don't have a good notation for that one. 1 to n and j 1 to n. OK, so this is a, a matrix with entries that have the variables i and j in them. And that will be the summation. That is the summation from the matrix, ma matrix multiplication. And since this guy is transposed, it will be a um, ki times a kj. OK, maybe that's the first difficult step. OK, so let's write it in general. So what is this? That is the summation from k of a i k times b k j. And again, I have i equals 1 to n and j equals 1 to n. So far, so good. This is really summing up the inner dimension. So the inner dimension are these guys here. Yeah. This is really row times column. So iterating along the columns and along the row from the other thing. Now I'm having the first matrix transposed, which basically means I need to swap i and k. That's why I'm having ki, and here I have k, kj. OK, so far so good. Now the trace is summing up again. Uh, let's take l. And all the entries basically along the diagonal of this matrix. The entries along the diagonal of the matrix are the one where i is equal to j. So it's the summation over the summation over k of a k l times a k l. So now we can say one summation sign comes from the trace. 
The other summation sign comes from the matrix matrix multiplication. And now I can, for example, swap those two and do some things. And at the end, I can. Um, Okay, where do I want to get to? I want to get to the case that A, let's say A has these columns. Okay, so I want to have a summation over the second coordinate. So this could be also written as a summation over the L. And then basically I'm having the inner product of A, L with itself. Or I can write it as a squared norm of that one. OK, I hope this is clear. I have a matrix of column vectors. And I want to have the summation of all the norms of these column vectors. And going backwards, I can also write it as the Frobenius norm. And it's just about which is the order of this summation. OK, I hope I convinced you now that this thing that we want to minimize here can be written also with the Frobenius norm. So far, so good? OK. OK, next step. So W should be unitary orthonormal, but I'm a little bit stretching the notion here. So W is a rectangular matrix. And for me, now it just means that the W transpose W is equal to I, but not the other way around. OK? Um, now, the thing is, let's define the covariance matrix. And we can very sh briefly define it like this. OK, that's the next thing for the board that I should show you, that this is really the covariance matrix, OK? Um, OK, let me try to show it. So um, we said the mean is 0. So normally, the covariance matrix will be xi minus mu squared. But for the multivariate case, it will be the outer product of all the vectors with each other. And we sum over i equals 1 to n. And we have 1 divided by n, for example, or 1 divided by n minus 1. Okay, So that is the typical covariance matrix. So let's um, have the uh, mean being equal to 0. Then we have basically the outer product of these vectors. Yeah? So that is what we need to calculate. And now I'm saying, OK, alternatively, you can also write it like this. You take the full data matrix and you multiply it with the data matrix transpose, which intuitively really looks nice, right? So it's just the same expression. Only we got rid of the summation sign and of the subindices. Yeah? So it's kind of easy to, to think about. Let's write it out. So it's x1 to xn. And then we have x1 transpose to x1 transpose. And now the difficulty is, um, when I'm writing this as this summation here, I, I can have rho times column, rho times column, rho times column. What will happen? The xi will only hit the xi transpose. Right? The xi will never see any of the other guys, which kind of matches that one. And now I'm just using a more advanced rule for row times column. I do row times column, but the entries are not scalars, but vectors. And if you think about this matrix like this, it's an n column matrix with one row. But each row, each entry is a vector. Again, this one is a matrix where I'm having n rows, but only one column. But I have lots of row vectors in them. And then row times column just means, so this is the same as summation of xi, xi transpose, which is exactly that. And when you do it by hand, you could also do it for every entry here. Yeah? You will see that it's really allowed and that it's, it's the same. OK. So here's something wrong with my computer. I don't know what's going on. So how can I check this? Activity monitor? Who's taking all the CPU? I did the same setup with 
with the 2014 MacBook, and it also worked. So this should work too. I don't know. Firefox isolated, blah. Interesting. Okay, but we are back. Okay, we are back to the slides. Okay, so this is a short way to write the covariance matrix. And then I'm just doing the eigenvector decomposition of this matrix, of the covariance matrix. What is the eigenvector decomposition? Again, something where I have a slide for. So any symmetric matrix A can be decomposed as follows, as W times lambda times W, OK? So now, uh, what does this have to do with eigenvalues like you learned them, right? You learned probably something else. So let me show you what it has to do with what you learned. So I think, or I can tell you how I learned it, and I guess that's the way you learn it. If you have a matrix A, we say V is an eigenvector if A times V is being equal to lambda times V, right? That's the way you learn it. What does it mean? It means you have some vector, this one for example, and if you map it with A, only the length is changing, not the direction. And that's something very special. Yeah? And you have it for the first vector with some lambda. Yeah? But you might also have it for another vector. Yeah? So that might be the second eigenvector. And this lambda is called eigenvalue. Yeah? We will see it today again. So how can I put this into one equation? So how about writing A times V1? And let's stack those into one matrix here. Then basically, A times this matrix will be equal to, it will be, um, now how am I doing this? Lambda. It will be V1 and V2 times lambda 1 lambda 2. OK, is this right? Yeah, let's see. Row times column, row times column. So the lambda 1 is only hitting the v1, OK? And the lambda 2 is only hitting the v2. So this is a way to write the same thing as up here, but to write it now using matrices. Let's write it more general. Let's say we have a big matrix with lots of columns, with all eigenvectors, OK? It also appears on the other side. And then we have a matrix, let's call it lambda, capital lambda. That is the diagonal matrix where I put the eigenvalues along the diagonal. And then we are almost there. Now multiply on both sides with V transpose. And the eigenvectors are also orthonormal. So they are basically then disappearing on the right-hand side. And we end up with this expression. OK, this is a very handy way to write down all equations simultaneously with only few letters. It only takes time to explain this stuff on the board. Once you accept this, you, you can use it at many locations. OK? So this is a very efficient way to write down that the columns of V are the eigenvectors of A, and the diagonal matrix lambda contains all eigenvalues along its diagonal. OK, that's what I wrote down here as well. Lambda is the diagonal matrix, V is some unitary matrix, and blah, 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 blah. OK? And this is just another way to write this, what you already knew. OK, so far so good. So where were we? We were that the covariance matrix can be written like that. Yes, the covariance matrix, it's a squared symmetric matrix, so it has an eigenvector decomposition. Yeah? And then we will show now, ideally in 30 minutes, that the optimal W, yeah, that is optimal in this respect here, will contain the D columns of the matrix V yeah, with, from the largest eigenvalues. So basically, you do the eigenvector decomposition, you look for the largest eigenvalues, and the co corresponding columns in V are the solution to our PCA problem. OK? So far, so good. So we talked about that one. We talked about PCA versus linear regression already on the board. Here's the second version, maximizing the variance. So that's another way to think about PCA instead of um, trying to find some 
some straight line where we align the data with the smallest error, we can also look for the direction of largest variance. Okay, that's kind of curious. Maybe I still need, again, this picture, but think of these points here. And then, well, maybe I should draw a picture for that one. Um, so that was this picture like this. And that was the perfect solution, right, which was minimizing these, all these points. And in a way, if I project my data onto this axis, I will have here 0 and maybe here a 10 and here minus 10. Yeah, so this is a new coordinate axis. And I can project my data on it. And PCA says, find the direction such that the variance after projection is maximized. Yeah, and you could imagine what happens if I project all my data onto this axis. So then I project that point here, that one over there, and like this. And possibly this is only 7.5, and this is minus 7.5. OK, the numbers are much smaller, and the variance is smaller. So why can I do this with really writing something down? Because my W is a unitary matrix. So my W is really having vectors of length 1. That's why all these inner products really make sense that we compare them. So finding one direction that maximizes the variance yeah, is another way to do it. Let's write it down mathematically. So mathematically, it means uh, we are looking only for one direction here, only one W. Yeah? And we want to project all our x onto this w, so we get a single number, and we calculate its variance. Yeah, the mean is still 0, so we just sum these up. And again, this summation could be written as w transpose times my whole data set. Okay? And that's just another way to get rid of the summation sign, in the same fashion that we've seen before. And I want to maximize this problem here, subject to the constraint, that the w has length 1. Yeah? Why is that important? Of course, I can maximize it by just letting w go through the roof. right? But the w should be like on the surface of a sphere. Good. Um, what else do I have on this slide? Um, blah, blah, blah. Ah, OK. It turns out that this thing is also, the w is, again, the eigenvector for the largest eigenvalue of my covariance matrix. OK, so that's the same thing. OK, so far so good. We've seen two versions of PCA. Yeah? One was minimizing the mean squared error, and one was maximizing the variance. And we will show, not on the next slide, but later, that both are equivalent. So mathematically speaking, so the argmax of maximizing the variance with respect to w yeah, will lead to the same w if I do the argmin of the w, where I'm also having another min inside. So I need to minimize with respect to z as well. OK, so here's some in, inner pro problem as well. OK, let's get some algorithm yeah, for fun in between. So here's the PCA algorithm now. This is a slide that you need to implement okay, in your exercises. So given some data set, calculate the covariance matrix, calculate the eigenvector decomposition, find the vectors with the largest eigenvalue, and that's basically it. Then you can project the data onto these eigenvectors, yeah? and you get the rep representation z. Uh, you could also possibly rescale it with the square root of this lambda matrix. This is like whitening the data in signal processing. So basically, you are saying, after this operation, I want to have that every variance is equal to 1. So basically, you can blow up the smaller variances. So this is an optional step, and it's changing the shape. Okay? So if after this projection, or maybe your initial projection is a cigar. Yeah, I don't know. No one knows any more cigars, but they look like this. Yeah? And they are in three-dimensional space, or maybe there's a cigar in 1,000-dimensional space. And with PCA, you can bring it back to three-dimensional space. Okay? And then you're done, and you get the cigar. So that is the Z at this point. However, sometimes you want to turn the cigar into a sphere. Okay? And then you need to rescale with the eigenvalues. Yeah, the eigenvalues correspond to the variances. OK, so far so good. Um, let's look at the, a little demo here now. Hopefully it works. So I changed the code a little bit. I'm now using the right convention. I'm importing all the libraries properly, and I don't overrule anymore these rand, rand, n, and these things. So that led to a very interesting bug last night. And I think one of you 
found the solution. What was the problem? It was you? Great. So thanks for that one. So the problem was that I'm allowing 0, 3, 4. And um, usually you are only allowed to put a tuple at the first position at the 0, because the second position is a data type. And then there was like a hard to find bug. And uh, one of you figured it out. Great. OK, so now this is all gone. I rewrote the code so that this kind of bug doesn't happen anymore. Here's some code to generate random rotations and blah, blah, blah. Some preliminary stuff that I usually do to find out how the functions work. For example, you should find out how does this Ike function work. OK, look at the documentation. And then it will tell you something. There's a function Ike and another one called Ike H, slightly different. And then you need to write code like this yourself. Don't copy and paste it. Take a random matrix, make it symmetric by A plus A transpose, for example. That's a simple way to symmetrize the matrix. Look at the lambda and the V that you get and check that you know how to recover the A from the V and the lambda. Okay? And again, this piece of code took me 20 minutes to get it right. You have to fill around, you have to play around. So what exactly am I getting back? Oh, the lambda is a vector. Then I need to pass it into a diag before I can multiply it. Oh, the V, is it now transposed or not? What do I have to do? So figure this out and then run it. And ideally, the matrices are the same. So if they are the same, the decomposition was good. And you can even go further. OK, it's promising now that the V is um, orthonormal. Let's check that. So you calculate that one. And ideally, you get a matrix, which is the identity matrix. And that one is the identity matrix. Check all these things from hand, by hand. Yeah, Always do that. OK, here's something for SVD we haven't talked about, some plotting stuff. So here comes my 2D data set rotated into 3D plus noise. OK, so here's the data set. So it's somewhere, how do I do this? Oh, yeah, it's somewhere rotated into space, right? You can look from here, from there, from the top. You always see some variance. Only if you rotate it correctly, then you see there is no variance in here. OK, I could increase the noise, and there would be everywhere variance. Um, let's run PCA on it. OK, that's a function you need to implement. Yeah? It gives you the embedding and also the eigenvalues and also the eigenvectors. And then you plot it. And then you nicely now um, find that you found the eigenvectors. And I plotted them into this plot. And you see this thing in the middle. So that is the one, the eigenvector, which is a very, very small eigenvalue. OK? And with this, you have a new coordinate system. And you can project your data onto it. I don't know, do I do this? Do I project it on it? No, I don't do it. Um, you can also take the MNIST digits. Yeah, so here's some functions that help you to look at the MNIST digits. You can do the same, curiously, and look at the eigendigits. And now you can imagine eigenvectors, eigendigits. They are also eigenfaces. There are many, you can apply the PCA method to any data set. Then you have eigenfish, or you have eigenquestionnaires, or eigen whatever you like. So here are the eigendigits. And basically, now here I'm picking all the twos. OK, so those are all the twos from my data. And I'm running PCA on the twos. So this is a bit more challenging here, because the twos is a data set that has, let's say, 20,000 twos. And the twos are 28 by 28 matrices. So my PCA function, what it does is it's first collapsing all the extra dimension yeah, and reshaping it into a, into a rectangular matrix from being a tensor into a rectangular matrix. Then it runs PCA, and then it does the same thing, operation backwards, with the eigenvector. So my eigenvectors that I get here will have the same shape as the twos, and I can just plot it. So and those are the eigen twos. So those are the principal components of the twos. OK, it's quite nice. You can also look at the eigenvalue spectrum. So what is that one? That is just plotting the lambdas. So it's telling you, OK, the first eigenvector explains 400,000, uh, a variance of 400,000. And then the second one explains another 250,000, and so on and so forth. So the variances are going down. Yeah? That basically means now if I reconstruct my twos from a few components, for example from five, then I take only the five largest eigenvalues, and I project the data on the corresponding eigenvectors and look at the reconstruction. And that is basically what you can see here now. Okay, So you see it's quite varied. So it can explain a lot of the two-ness, yeah, these five dimensions already. 
Okay, so far so good. So this is a demo for you to play around with. But you first need your PCA implementation. But if you don't have it and you want to play around with the demo, import PCA from sklearn, write a wrapper around sklearn PCA, and then you can also run the code, right? But you won't get points for writing a wrapper around PCA from sklearn. OK, so those are the MNIST digits and the eigendigits. Um, here's some more information which I put in here. So there's the sample covariance matrix, and then there's also one from the maximum likelihood estimation. And one has a 1 divided by n, and the other one has a 1 divided by n minus 1. I don't go into the details. I don't care which one you use. When you have 60,000 data points, it doesn't matter. Um, for the mathematicians among you, this one is unbiased, in German, erwartungstreu. So if I take the expectation over all data sets with n data points, then the expectation will be the true sigma, right? That means unbiased or erwartungstreu, and this one is not erwartungstreu. So it's not super bad, so sometimes you want to have a not erwartungstreuer Schätzer. So sometimes you want to have an unbiased estimator because it might have a smaller error at the end. So that can happen. Anyway, no details on this one, just for your pleasure. So now comes the main thing. So why is the direction of the largest variance the eigenvector? Yeah? Why is that the eigenvector? Why is the direction of the largest variance? So here's the double the eigenvector in here. So the sentence should read, why is the direction of the largest variance, the largest eigenvalue? Oh, no, I got confused. So too much eigenfaces and eigendigits here. So let me repeat it. So the question is, why is the direction of largest variance given by the eigenvector that corresponds to the largest eigenvalue? So that was a true statement now. Uh, question. So that's what we are going to talk about now. How are we doing this? Of course, with an optimization problem. Yeah? And it's a constraint optimization problem. We are maximizing the variance that here, that is this one, subject to some constraint. And it's a squared constraint. So it's mm, a bit more difficult. So it might be non-convex. No, it is convex, but this is like a nonlinear constraint. OK, this is just written down again, the calculation why the summation is equal to this shortcut. OK? Let's rewrite the objective as follows. So the squared norm of this row vector, so w1 transpose times x is a row vector. And so the norm of that one can be also written out like this. OK? So this is the same as saying the norm of vector v is equal to v transpose times v. Yeah, that's basically what I did here. And then there pops out the covariance matrix in here. So I can also write it as w1 transpose times sigma times w1. So far, so good. Let's write the Lagrangian. So the Lagrangian is just w1 transpose times my covariance matrix times w1. That's what I wanted to maximize minus my equality constraint. And I need to introduce the Lagrange multiplier here. Lambda like Lagrange multiplier, I give away already the, 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 the surprise. Lambda is also the eigenvalue. Okay? So very curious. In this optimization problem, the, the Lagrange multiplier will turn out to be the eigenvalue of the whole system. Yeah? And I show you why. Let's calculate the derivative of that one, or the differential. So we put a d in front of that one. That's just a squared thing. So I can drag out the w1 transpose sigma and put a 2 in front minus lambda 1, and here I have the inner product. We did that also thousands of times. So that is the derivative with respect to w1 of the Lagrangian. Let's set it to 0. When you set it to 0, the 2 goes away, and then you bring, bring 1 to the other side, and you end up with this very familiar-looking expression. That is just the expression for the eigenvector. So from this expression, we just read off Oh, that's surprising. W1 is the eigenvector of sigma, right? Um, we could ask now, which is it? Is it the one for the smallest, the largest, some intermediate one? So let's look at it. Let's multiply this expression from the left with W1 transpose, and we get the next equation. In the next equation now, we can also replace the W1 transpose W1 with 1, because that was our constraint that we want to fulfill. So we get an equation that is equal to lambda 1. 
interesting. We are maximizing this expression. That was the objective. So it's like maximizing the lambda 1. Okay? So we see the w1 that we get here is exactly the eigenvector for the largest eigenvalue w, uh, lambda 1. We are not really using now the Lagrange multiplier method here to derive a dual or anything like that. We just use it to get some interesting equations that we can then interpret. And then we can read off, oh, th I know that one. That is the eigenvector. Oh, I know that one. That is the eigenvalue. Okay? So that is quite nice. Um, and I didn't, made, I, I didn't invent it, so I copied it from somewhere. I forgot where. Maybe I should look it up. So this is like a nice derivation of why the um, direction of largest variance, this is the largest variance here. That is the variance of uh, my projection. Why does it correspond to the direction of the largest eigenvector? Good. Let's find the second largest variance. OK, the second largest variance now has two constraints. I have another vector of length 1, and I want to be orthogonal to my first one. Two new constraints. I get a new Lagrangian with a new equality constraint and a new Lagrange multiplier over here. Let's calculate the differential. Again, this is really simple when you write it out. And I get another expression that I can set to 0. So let's set it to 0. Whoops. So here I set it to 0. And now again, I need to do some reasoning. First, I multiply it from the left with w1 transpose. OK, I get here some mixed term. Here I'm having a mixed term. And here I'm having the usual one that I had more often. So z1 is equal to 1. So that's already easy. So the new times 1. Now what about the second one? w1 times w2 should be equal to 0, because they are orthogonal on each other. So that is 0. Great. So I'm left with the first one. So what can I use here? So the w1 is an eigenvector of sigma. For that reason, I can rewrite it. It's like saying sigma times w1 is equal to lambda 1 w1. So I can replace the marked expression with w1 times lambda 1. OK? And if I do that, I again get another 0. This is w1 times w2. So all I'm left with is um, the new is equal to 0. That's it, what I derived here. So if nu is equal to 0, then the initial equation is just giving me another hint what w2 is. It is also an eigenvector. And it turns out one can then similarly show as before that it will correspond to the second largest eigenvector okay, uh, value. Okay? OK, so that is the derivation. So what have we seen? We've seen that the direction of largest variance is the eigenvector of the largest eigenvalue of the covariance matrix. Okay? And this is a bit technical, I admit, but I hope every step is simple. Question? And you wanted to find the, the third largest eigenvector. Do you then have three constraints? Yes, very much. And it would be a really nice exercise. But I think we don't do this. But it would be, an, if, if, you, if you like it, if you think, great, I want to be good at Lagrange, I want to be good at all this, do it yourself. Just try to write it up. But it takes usually some time. In particular, then these steps, how to get rid, um, oops, how to get to this equation, it's always a bit cumbersome. And so what did I use? I used the fact that w1 is an eigenvector. I used that fact. And I used the fact that the constraints should be fulfilled up to here. And then ideally, you can derive it also for w3 and lambda3. OK? Anyway, for me, the eye opener or the wow was that the lambda Lagrange multiplier is an eigenvalue. So I found that very surprising. OK, what's next? Next is, OK, we have two ways of doing PCA. Now, why is it the same? Let's derive this. And let's use our linear algebra superpowers, OK? So first of all, let's look at the minimizing the mean squared error. So I wrote it already in an advanced manner. So this is the Frobenius norm. It's yeah, all entries squared. That's why there's a trace in front of it. And it's minimized in w and z. Let's first get rid of the z. And then we have an expression in w that we can compare with the other one. So without loss of generality, I can assume in this minimization that the w transpose w is an orthonormal system. So this w l o g without loss of generality, that is in German translate OBDR. 
oder Beschränkung der Allgemeinheit. So that's the same thing. It's really identical. So this basically says, so there are solutions, W for this minimization problem, which minimizes, yeah, but they are as good as an orthonormal version of the W. Why is that the case? If I have one that doesn't fulfill this constraint, I look at the singular value decomposition, which we look at next time. Yeah. So we basically, the singular value decomposition um, decomposes W into different parts, and I can shuffle around the parts between W and Z to get a W which is really orthonormal. That's always possible. So this gets a bit more fancy. It's an optimization problem, but now we have like matrix many equalities here. Yeah, so it's like a matrix equal a matrix. It's like having, like for every entry in the matrix, I have an equality constraint. So that means I need a matrix of Lagrange multipliers. So the M is a matrix of Lagrange multipliers now. Every entry in the matrix M is a Lagrange multiplier. And if I want to multiply the M with each of these equations, then I take the Frobenius norm. So that is the trace of M times my constraint being equal to zero. Okay, this is again using the same trick. So it's like every entry mij times every entry of this combined matrix and everything summed up. Yeah? So far so good? You trust me on that one. Okay? <laughs> no, you can, you can work it out. It's the same reasoning that we had on the board. So the good thing is I'm not coming every, every time with new stuff that you need to learn. I'm just showing you always the same stuff. Yeah, the, mo the key ingredient here is to understand that the Frobenius norm of a matrix is really the sum of the squared elements. Uh, the sum of the squared elements, where is it? Oh, I didn't wrote it down. So let me write it as well. So it's really So this is super useful if you have it. And if you have that one, you can plug in for the A a vector, a column vector, and you get the inner product, right? Or you can plug in a scalar, and you have the scalar one. So that is the general way of writing something like this. Um, that is one idea. The other idea is you have summations across data points, and you can also rewrite it as a matrix matrix multiplication of the data. That's always the same thing. So far, so good. So this is a Lagrangian, and now comes the power of Oh, there's another the power of our differential calculus. So this is harder to calculate the derivative of without differential calculus because now we have matrices. Yeah, that gets really messy. However, if you put a D in front, it gets it's quite simple. So this thing doesn't have um, this thing doesn't have a Z in, and we are interested in the derivative with respect to Z because we want to get rid of the Z. So this is just constant, and it goes away. And this is just a squared form sum of the entries of Z. And if you follow the rules from the sheet sheet, yeah, then you can derive this expression and read off the derivative to be minus 2 times the trace. Oh, no, the derivative is minus 2 times x minus wz transposed w. So that is the derivative of this expression with respect to Z. Okay? The minus 2 should go into the trace. Otherwise, the identification formula has a trace of two matrices, and there's no scalar or something in front of it. Anyway, setting it to 0, I get this equation. Yeah, So the w gets multiplied with the x, the w gets multiplied with the wz. And I get this equation over here, which then simplifies, because I'm assuming that the w transpose w's identity just to z. So again, I'm using the Lagrangian method to solve this optimization problem. I'm just solving it for z now. So I got a closed form solution for the z, okay, by using the Lagrange multiplier method. And there's no dual, and there's no whatever, no KKT condition. So this is just a vehicle now to get interesting equations and to, get, um, to simplify stuff. Okay, what can I do with this expression for the z? I can plug it in, OK? Let's plug it into my objective. And now it gets more and more messy here. So I'm plugging this z in to this objective here to get rid of it. So let's look at it. This was just plugged in. And this is now just multiplying out. Yeah, the product of two sums yeah, gives me four terms. 
one appears double. And then let's be very, let's look for the nice thing. So here's the W transpose W. And that is the identity matrix. So it goes away. And we see that this expression is the same as the one before. Yeah? So we can combine it. So minus 2, this expression, plus this expression is the same as minus that expression. OK? Nice, very nice. So we now have an expression yeah, that we need to minimize with respect to w. So now this proves what we wanted to prove. So let's look at it. So the, we see that the argument with respect to z and w can be rewritten as the argument with respect to w, yeah, where this is, this is a bit strange here. Argmin means that I get the z and the w out, so I should rewrite that. So this is the argument with respect to w of the minimum with respect to z. Yeah? And then I can say, OK, if it's the argument of the trace here, I can also um, get rid of um, the first term, because there's no w in here. right? And then I'm having the trace of minus this stuff. And here's a trace missing. So there must be a trace too. OK? So the minus sign goes away because I go from minimum to maximum. And once I've done it, I'm at the expression for the variance. And now each of these steps are kind of like big things. There's only, they are only easy when you have the matrix matrix notation. Otherwise, it's super painful, I think. If you find a good book where it's easy without this stuff, then show me, tell me. OK, so now what have we shown? We have shown that minimizing the mean squared error and maximizing the variance is the same thing. OK? So it doesn't matter which you do. So again, this is the slide to remember for the exercise. This is PCA step by step. And the lecture was about why um, is that the solution, right? So why is, are the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix a solution? And the uh, um, approximate reasoning was to understand that um, actually minimizing the mean squared error is equivalent to maximizing the variance. And maximizing the variance leads to an eigenvector problem. Okay? Maybe there's a shortcut that kind of gets rid of this maximizing the variance. Maybe we can also directly apply it to this expression and get the equations for the eigenvectors. So maybe that's something to try. However, the intuition with the variance is quite nice. And that will be the last thing I say. So there's a version of nonlinear dimensionality reduction, which works like this. You have a cloud point, so let's say on a curved surface. So now there are lots of points. And then you have little strings between neighboring points. OK, so you have a point, and you, draw, you put strings to your nearest neighbors. And then you drag the whole thing as much as possible. And that is a one-dimensional embedding that is maximizing the variance, but along the manifold. So the idea of maximizing the variance for dimensionality reduction is a nice one. And it can be translated into nonlinear version as well. And guess what it will be? It will be some constraint optimization problem. This maximizing the variance with the strings. And it can be solved with some optimization packages as before. How did people come up with? I think they were attending NIPS, NeurIPS conference at some point, And there was Stephen Boyd giving some invited talk on convex optimization. Because people were interested in convex optimization because of support vector machines. And after that year, many people wrote very interesting machine learning papers that were using convex optimization or methods from optimization to solve some interesting data science problems. Okay? So that's how new de methods often develop. Anyway, that's it. Next time, we will kernelize PCA and look at a nonlinear version of that one. But for today, um, we are done. Thank you for your attention, and see you next Monday. <laughs>